Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am happy to welcome you all to our webinar this afternoon. My name is Julie Rayner, and I'm at the High Point Public Library, and I'm the chair of the Technology and Trends Roundtable. And I am playing the road of, role of Chad Hayfully today. He has uh, um, not been able to make it, but we're going to get through this. Um, so thanks for joining us, everybody, in, in this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce to you um, Amanda Glenn Bradley, who's the User Engagement Librarian at UNC Asheville, and John Bradley, who's the Systems Programmer, Web Administration, Information Technology, Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College. And these expert folks are going to be doing our presentation today, um, which is Bootstrap Basics for LibGuides 2.0, Accessibility and Dynamic Design for Libraries. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Amanda. And I'll be watching chat. So feel free to chat in when you, when you can. All right, thanks, Julie. So as Julie mentioned, hi, my name is Amanda. I am the user engagement librarian at the University of North Carolina Asheville. Shameless plug, I am also one of the directors for technology and trends. If you have not joined yet, you should totally join our organization. We're a pretty awesome group of people. Um, just a little fun thing on my academic background. I am not a computer scientist at all. I have two bachelor's degrees. One is in horticulture with an emphasis in floral management. Yes, that is a real thing, I promise. It's from Mississippi State University, but I also have a degree in history, which is my absolute academic love. And I am a very proud graduate of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro's program in library and information studies. And I'm John Bradley. For our purposes today, you can call me the web administrator at AB Tech. Uh, that's a little bit of a cumbersome title. Um, I do have a, a degree in computer science from Mississippi State, and I also have a master's in instructional technology. So if you could not already tell, we are actually legally entangled with one another. And I affectionately call John the Obi-Wan Kenobi to my Luke Skywalker of web design. I am one of the web administrators of our library website at UNC Asheville and had to learn a lot of this on my own. And John has helped out tremendously because he has built not one, not two, but three college and university websites now. So what we're going to be talking about today is going to be briefly, we're going to cover a history of the World Wide Web. We are on the web now. We need to be able to understand where, where we've come from and where we're going to be going. And then John is going to explain exactly what makes a website because it can be kind of difficult to understand. And then we are all about buzzwords in our end of the world. So we've got a few buzzwords that you're going to hear us use quite a bit and we've got definitions for them. That's dynamic design, responsive design, and web accessibility. Then we're going to talk about where Bootstrap fits into all of this, specifically what it is, and then how it works within the confines of LibGuides 2.0, especially now that SpringShare has deep sixed all of its 1.0 software. And then we're going to go into some examples and resources of things that we've done at my library. And then we're going to have time for what we affectionately call quimits, which are questions, comments, and existential crises. Now, as you're going along, feel free to pop things into the chat. I've got the chat window open so we can address things as we see them, but we are going to have time at the end. And because I work in information literacy, I'm also big on outcomes. Hey, so why are we covering things? things. What we want you to come away with today is an understanding of the roles that dynamic design, responsive design, and web accessibility play within the scope of our web presences as librarians and professional staff, an understanding of what Bootstrap is and how it relates to LibGuides and the LibGuides CMS, a working knowledge of some of the functionality afforded by Bootstrap's integration, examples of Bootstrap and other responsive and dynamic design elements within LibGuides 2.0, and also, big thing, you're going to come away with a network of fellow librarians, library staffers, and hey, even a couple of information technology folks that you can use to rely on for brains to pick. We're an amazing field when it comes to collaboration, and I want this to be the start of collaboration for folks. So without further ado, the history of the World Wide Web, part one. Yes, it's a Mel Brooks reference. Yes, we went there. John, take it away. 
So the World Wide Web began primarily with a man named Sir Timothy John Berners-Lee, O-M-K-B-E-F-R-S-F-R-E-N-G-F-R-S-A-F-B-C-S. I have no idea what those letters stand for. Also known as simply Tim Berners-Lee, the father of the World Wide Web, as we know it. So Tim Berners-Lee's first job after graduating from Oxford was actually working for the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. The acronym for it is C-E-R-N or CERN. It is something long and complicated in French that I shall not butcher the pronunciation of. So in 1989, he recognized that we were already using a form of an intranet at that point in time. Email was already starting to become a thing, especially with large technical oriented organizations. So he wrote a white paper called Information Management a Proposal. Now what's interesting is A, you can still go on and read this at the W3C, but B, his boss wrote at the top, this is very intriguing, a little ephemeral, but very intriguing. And it was actually the, groundwork of what would become the internet that we know it as today. So come 1990, Tim Berners-Lee identified and helped create three of the fundamental technologies that we still use today in the web. So the first one is hypertext markup language, that's HTML. HTML is a way in which we as people can structure content uh, inside of tags using tags and attributes to give context to the uh, material that we're trying to convey. And then there's the URI or the URL. We typically call it a URL nowadays, but it actually stands for Uniform Resource Identifier. We can also call that an address. And if all of you are on a web browser watching this, you can look up at your address bar and see what a URL looks like. It typically begins with protocol and colon slash slash, a domain name, and often a slash, and then more information that the site uses to guide you in your visit to that site. So John just briefly mentioned protocol. He also created what's called HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's basically a pointer to whatever document you're looking at. It, true. So then come 1994, Tim Berners-Lee jumped over the pond and came to the MIT and founded the World Wide Web Consortium, also known as the W3C. So the W3C is still an active organization today. Tim Berners-Lee is still the executive director of it. And one thing that he has always pushed for is openness in the web. Actually, if you want to go back and watch a video of the 2012 opening ceremony of the London Olympic Games, you'll notice Tim Berners-Lee is there. And he actually tweeted during the Olympics that this is for everyone. He meant the Olympics, he meant the World Wide Web as well. So big things that the W3C stand for is open data, open government, oh look librarians, open access, and also free culture, trying to make the web accessible for everyone. Kind of sounds like what we try to do every day, doesn't it? So uh, what exactly is a website, John? Well, in the beginning there was text, and I know it's a little small to see, but that first screenshot there is the very first web page uh, ever, there you go, <laughs> uh, as seen in a text browser, which was all we had back in the early 90s. Um, this was written in the very first iteration of HTML, and uh, this was written by Tim Berners-Lee to demonstrate the, the very basics of a web page, text and hyperlinks. Uh, again, it's kind of difficult to see, but there are some hyperlinks there. They're just brighter white text. So the core of a website is HTML. Again, that is the markup language in which content is structured. Um, as time went on, people wanted more and more out of their web pages, so more and more features were added to HTML. Uh, the ability to embed images, for instance, audio, video, uh, and so on. Well, as time went on, HTML became less uh, <laughs> HTML became uh, less capable of doing what everyone wanted it to do. So CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets, was created. CSS brings appearance, arrangement, and limited animation to the presentation that is a web page. Uh, also, there's JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is a programming language uh, that is executed in your web browser. Um, 
it brings significantly more animation, uh, event programming, manipulation of HTML and CSS, and a whole lot more. So each of these are defined by standards written by the W3C and then ECMA International, which is actually an organization from Europe that helps define these standards. So web browsers implement features based on these standards. You're going to notice that we're going to come back around to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript when we actually start talking about Bootstrap. So we mentioned earlier that there are some buzzwords that we're going to be working, kind of key concepts. What are they and why do they matter so much? So let's get into that. The first one that we're going to hit is dynamic design. John, what exactly is dynamic design? Well, dynamic design is the use of server side programming and client side programming to create a robust and engaging experience. So if you think of a static page, uh, it's just uh, text on a page. Uh, dynamic design is something that is animated, interactive, tailor made for you. Uh, you're able to log into it, you're able to browse around, you're able to contribute to the page, so on and so forth. Uh, dynamic design web pages use extensive use of cutting edge web technologies. The most recent version of HTML, modern CSS, JavaScript, and a, a whole lot more. Uh, dynamic design introduces and extends several web design concepts over uh, static design, so the concept of forms so that you can submit information to the web server, uh, menus, uh, pop-ups, and so on. And we'll get into a little bit more of that when we talk about Bootstrap. So why is dynamic design so important for us in libraries? So dynamic design allows websites to be web services more than anything. Let's face it, most of us have an online version of our catalog here at UNC Asheville. We're in innovative use, so we use Sierra. Our patron expects libraries to offer resources online. Let's think of our partnership with NC Live. Most all of those resources, in fact, I believe all of those resources are available online. This is going to be our catalogs, account access to where our patrons can actually log on and renew a book instead of having to physically come in or call us. Online resources, ebooks, video streaming, there's so much content that's available. And uh, bonus buzzword time, we've got Web 2.0. If uh, you have been in a class with Dr. Chow at UNCG, you have heard the use of Web 2.0 quite a bit. So the definition of Web 2.0 is any content that is generated by a user, its core concept is usability, and there's also interoperability for end users. Basically, the end user can access this from a multitude of different locations. A big part of Web 2.0 is the social web as well. So we've alluded to it a little bit already, but we're going to go on to responsive design now. So responsive design is a fairly recent concept. Uh, a responsive design uh, implemented in a web page, the, the web page renders well on a variety of browsers windows and screen sizes and devices. Um, you've probably seen designs that are fixed width, where if you move your web browser from, uh, if you resize it from left to right, it, the, the content doesn't change. You've probably also seen fluid design, where when you do the same, resize your web browser, the page kind of stretches and shrinks and stretches like an accordion. Responsive de design is similar to fluid design, except for the fact that when you resize it, the web page looks like it fits perfectly in that new size. So one thing that you hear a lot of times with this responsive design is a phrase that content is like water. So think of water. It looks different when you put it in a coffee mug. It looks different when you put it in an aquarium, but it's still water. The content is still there, but it's being fit to whatever device or whatever method you're using to look it up. So a term that we use for this is user interface plasticity. What that means is your user interface is going to stretch or mold based on whatever way your user is looking at it. There's another term we use too called adaptive design. And this was in, in some ways the original idea of what to do when you have mobile browser users, tablet users, uh, and desktop users coming to your site all at once. Adaptive design involves multiple designs for singular platforms. Responsive design is different. It's a single design that's designed to mold itself to multiple platforms. So why is responsive design so important for us? Uh, two words, mobile 
traffic. I'm a research librarian. What do I do? I go to Statista and I start looking up statistics. So this is a source from Merkle Digital Marketing Report that says that the mobile section or the mobile sector of organic search engine visits are steadily increasing when it comes to a mobile view. So in Q3 of 2013, so that's basically summertime of 2013, we were looking at around 27% of traffic on average coming from a mobile device. Q1 of 2018, so the winter of 2018, you're looking at 64%. So I have access to our analytics at UNC Asheville. Over half of our traffic that's coming to our library website is coming from a mobile platform. Another thing is mobile Geddon. We love things that end in Geddon in the tech world. So mobile Geddon happened in 2015 and Google completely changed their search algorithm to prioritize websites that displayed well on mobile or smartphone browsers. Now it wasn't as gloom or doom as it sounded. Uh, statistics say that only about 12% of websites were affected, but it really brought attention to the fact that so many of our users are coming to our information on mobile platforms now and we need to think about that. Now this next section, this is John's kind of just he, he adores talking about web accessibility. That's what he first started working in. It's what he did his graduate work on. John, exactly what is web accessibility? Well, web, web accessibility is the concept that your website is uh, usable and accessible by anybody, no matter what type of user, user agent they're using. Uh, as you, I said user agent. Your web browser is a user agent, but there are multiple types of user agents. Um, and there are some that we refer to as assistive technologies. These are screen readers, braille terminals, screen magnification tools, speech recognition, keyboard overlays, uh, videos with subtitles, for instance, and so on. These are devices that are designed to assist individuals who have uh, difficulty or are unable to uh, visit your website using a standard web browser. So where did this desire to help people come from. So there's the Web Accessibility Initiative that was started in 1997, three years after the W3C started, because as an industry, we recognized the fact that we needed to be as accessible as possible for individuals. There are two sets of web content accessibility guidelines. The first set came out in 1999. They've been revised quite a few times again, but the most recent version came out in 2008. So the WCAG 2.0 is actually recognized by the federal government as well as the standards that we need to adhere to. Why is this important for us? Y'all, we have a responsibility to our patrons to make sure that our websites are as accessible as they possibly possibly can be. This also comes with a legal responsibility. So fun fact, government and educational institutions are required to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act standards for accessible design. So there's two parts of this. There are Section 504 and 508 of the Rehabilitation Act that was passed in 1978 that the big thing is Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The first version of it was passed in 1990. George W. Bush updated it in 2008. What this basically does is this points towards standards that we need to adhere to. We think of accessibility a lot when it comes to our buildings. Do we have wide enough spaces in our stacks that an individual with mobility concerns can get around? Do we have braille on each of our little pylons that have signs on them? But our libraries are not just physical buildings anymore. Our libraries are online. Online holdings are a major part of what we do. There's a phrase that basically says your website is like your digital living room. When you walk into somebody's living room, that's going to give you a sense of not only who they are, but how welcoming they're going to be as well. Do Can you tell that they've got a cat or dog as soon as you walk in? Can you tell that they're busy and have strategic piles of laundry in their living room. I can neither confirm nor deny that happens in my house. But the thing is, when you walk into somebody's living room, it tells you who they are. Our websites are our online living room, and it tells people who we are. So we've covered the buzzwords, and we've covered the fact that websites need to be dynamic, they need to be responsive, and they need to be accessible. Where does Bootstrap fit into this? Well, Bootstrap can help you do all three without having to have a bachelor's of computer science from one of the top ranked engineering programs in the country. So exactly what is Bootstrap? So Bootstrap is a free and open source front end library 
or framework for designing websites and web applications. It was originally created in 2011 by Mark Otto and Jacob Thornton at Twitter, and originally they called it Twitter Blueprint. All Bootstrap is, is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, one of the benefits uh, to Bootstrap is you can drop it in and use it as a foundation for a strong website. And this eliminates the need for inline and embedded CSS and JavaScript because if any of y'all have tried to do either inline or embedded CSS in LibGuides, it can be a little problematic. I have broken my website a couple of times trying to do that. Now, there are a lot of major websites that are now built with Bootstrap. If you go to Bootstrap's website, which we'll have linked at the end, and go to the Expo, it's going to have links to them, but kind of pulled out some popular ones. Lyft is built on Bootstrap as is Vogue, the magazine. Spotify's web platform is, and my personal favorite, NASA. You know, if NASA's using it, it's pretty good. So bringing it down based on our buzz, buzzwords, uh, what does Bootstrap bring to the table? In regards to dynamic design, uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, front-end elements that dynamic design introduces or makes important, like forms, alert boxes, menus, and so on. Bootstrap standardizes each of those elements so that you don't have to worry about styling it yourself. You don't have to worry about any accessibility concerns that may come with it and so on. Um, and it, it's worth pointing out too that in dynamic design, there are one or two ways to do something right. And there are a lot of ways to do something wrong. So having a standards based uh, platform that you can begin with uh, eliminates most of those wrong areas and allows you to move forward uh, without breaking your site. So under responsive design, the default of Bootstrap is it's completely responsive. It's actually built originally for a mobile platform. They're called flat designs. So instead of having a ton of layers on top of each other, this is one flat website. It also loads very quickly. And as far as web accessibility is concerned, with an asterisk, Bootstrap is fully accessible, which means you can begin working with it. And as long as you don't do anything to break what Bootstrap has given you, you can have an accessible website. And with those asterisks, uh, the web, uh, the, the WAI ARIA attributes, um, which you can see in the examples that uh, Bootstrap has put on their website, those are still needed. Those are used by a web browser to better understand what a block of HTML is trying to do. And also the carousel that Bootstrap provides. Um, carousels are uh, rotating images or rotating content that you can scroll through or click through. Uh, those are typically not very accessible. And according to Bootstrap, their carousel is not. Or as they say, may not be accessible. We couldn't find any documentation. We searched for it because let's face it, we like documentation. So. Let's talk LibGuides and Bootstrap. So we're now on LibGuides version 2.0. Content migration for 2.0 began right around August of 2014. Now all of the 1.0 products were discontinued as of earlier this month. Y'all all probably got an email from SpringShare saying, hey, if you've got any content on the 1.0 websites, it's about to go bye-bye. Now what's in LibGuides 2.0 is actually Bootstrap 3.3.7, which is the second to newest version of it. The newest version of Bootstrap, which is 4.1, actually rolled out in mid-April of this year and waiting happily for SpringShare to update it. Now, another thing that SpringShare decided to implement with LibGuides 2.0 is something called Font Awesome. Now, there is Glyphicon support in Bootstrap 3.3.7, but they went above and beyond that and integrated Font Awesome. We're going to show you what that is in a few minutes. Now, looking at it, as far as web accessibility goes, we mentioned earlier it is Section 508 and Title III compliant with the caveats that we mentioned. The WAI ARIA standards still need to be in place, and you still carousel, not so much. Responsive design, it's fully scalable, designed with a mobile platform in mind, so you now no longer have a adaptive design version of LibGuides, you have a responsive design version. And with dynamic, oh, no more potential inline CSS and JavaScript issues, because like I said, broken the website one too many times. Now let's talk about examples, and admittedly, I'm going to be pulling a lot of these from my own personal work. 
So you will bear with me as I figure out how I can <laughs> share all of these. We're going to see if this works this way. We're going to come back over here and we're going to share an application. We're just going to share this. Nope, 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 nope. That's not what I wanted to do. And we're going to share my entire screen. So, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> You might have to follow along from home. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, uh, Firefox has decided to misbehave on me. So the very first example that I was going to talk about is actually the warning banner that we've got up on the Craft Studio website. So that is going to be at library.unca.edu slash craft studio. And what that is, is it's a box that will appear when I toggle it to be so that tells people if we've got a change in our hours, if we've got any kind of late fees that have kicked in because we do poster printing across campus. So that warning banner is actually an alert box from Bootstrap. What I've done is I've actually tweaked the colors a little bit to match our color scheme at work. Now the second example is just a basic menu button. So back in the day when I first started doing web programming, when you wanted to create a button, you had to create an image, you had to upload the image, you had to link the image properly, you had to do rollover text. It was a whole pain in the tail. So now you can actually do this as a button type within Bootstrap. So if you go to our using the library slash ILL site, and that's library.unca.edu slash using the library slash ILL, you're going to notice an orange button that changes colors when you roll over the top of it. No JavaScript required. That's actually just a Bootstrap functionality. And then there are media containers. So anytime that we have an event on campus that has an image associated with it, we used to use a table to do that. Well, tables typically do not resize very well when you're going to a mobile view. There's something called a media container within Bootstrap. And what we've done is we actually took it and we customized it just a little bit. I changed the size of the image. And what that media container does is it resizes the text in the image based on how large your screen is. So going into Bootstrap and Font Awesome examples. So we've got menu icons. So if you go to our library website and you're going to click on any of the top menus, you're going to notice that some of them have little icons next to them. Well, this is from Font Awesome. Font Awesome is basically a font that is installed on your browser that allows you to use, I think last time they updated it about 2,800 different icons. Another example of this is the sticky footer that we've got on our library's website. So if you go to either library.unca.edu or my other web-based baby, which is the faculty publications website, you're going to notice a footer at the bottom of it. That footer changes size and it stays on the bottom of the page no matter how large your website is or your browser is. The great thing about it as well is the fact that each of those icons, those aren't images. That's actually a font from Font Awesome. So the YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, all of those icons are actually a font. So they're fully going to scale as we're moving along as well. And I really wish Firefox had decided to let me do the whole screen sharing things. Wait a second. Hang on. Um... Let's see here. I'm going to try this one more time. Entire screen. Uh, remember this decision. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Entire screen. Allow. Let's see if it's going to work. Fingers crossed. Yay! Oop, oh. look, there we go. We're into the black <laughs> hole now. Okay, so now I actually get to show off our examples. Yay! All right, so the first one is going to be, by the way, this is our library website. We rolled this out in 2015. It has very much become my baby over the years. So the first example that we're going to look at now that it's behaving, I have my cheat sheet over here, is going to be the Craft Studio page. So this is going to be your warning box right here. So you'll notice that I've got it set up as a very nice, pretty blue. We use so much blue here at UNC Asheville. Now, if I pop over here into my delightful 
libguide cms and i'm going to go to my craft studio page so you can see by the way yes we're at home that was my cat donovan saying hi thanks donnie so when you come into your box let me go in and find my original version there we go I have it mapped multiple spots on my website, so if I just change it once, it's okay. So I'm going to go here into the HTML view so you can see what it looks like. Edit, view source. So what this is, is this class is your alert info. Your role is alert. Now, if I were to change alert info to alert, let's see if it'll let me click it, alert warning. save and close, you'll notice that it changed to yellow. So Bootstrap actually has a, the five, I believe, different colors of warning boxes. So our next example is going to be the button. So over here under search on my library website, the orange getting started button, this guy right here, it's just a Bootstrap button. And then if I go to using the library and go to enter library loan, the orange button with the log on to Iliad rolled over the top of it, it's the exact same thing. So let me see if I can get to that. So that is using the library. Um, gonna come, gonna come back a page. Let's see if it lets me back up a little bit. Nope, that's okay. Now I click on this window. borrowing, interlibrary borrowing. So let me show you, let's see here about this interlibrary loan. You will notice that it's a special button. That's all I had to use was had to use the A class of special buttons. And then it created that beautiful roll over the top button for me. It's the exact same button that's in our top menu as well. So then the media containers are going to be over here at our, doo -doo -doo. where did it go? I designed this website. I should know where things are. The events and exhibits page. So you will notice that each of our events that we have is going to be a little media container like this. So I'm going to pop back over to my CMS. Hit my back button a couple of times. Hit my back button once more. Go into my HTML, let's see here. And, aha, whomever copied this actually did not use one of my containers. Let me go back to the 2017 page because I know I, we've got about six of us that work on this website at once. So sometimes things get copied over properly and sometimes they don't, aha. So you will notice this span style right here that says box sizing. That's a media container. What it's going to do is it's going to change the size of the image and everything based on how wide my screen is. And in fact, let me give you an example. So if I go from here, you'll notice as I scrunch it, the text moves. And you'll notice that it caps out at basically the size of a tablet. So coming back here to a couple of font awesome examples, if you come up here and actually you can see it on the very top bar of our website, our top bar is actually bootstrapped as well. You'll notice there's a spyglass, there's a little book next to research support, there's a question mark next to get help, there's our little dude next to account, there's a little clock next to hours. These are all font awesome glyphs. Uh, one of my favorite ones happens to be over here under research support, the little three gears for the craft studio. It's actually pretty close to our um, logo that we use. But at the bottom of our website, you are going to notice this beautiful thing. So this admittedly is kind of my baby. This is the sticky footer. The sticky footer, as I change the size of my screen, you'll notice that my footer changes size. After a while, it actually takes away the social media view and just leaves this individual part right here. Let me show you what that code looks like. So 
so if I come into my admin screen, I come over here to look and feel, and I go down to my page footer. This is all a sticky footer. What I've done is I've established a footer class. So this is a standard class that comes with Bootstrap. I told it what background color I wanted it because we have a very specific shade of blue we have to work with. And then on my div class, I actually determined how wide all of my columns were and which of my columns will hide when it goes to the extra small size. So the column that hides at extra small happens to be my social media column. I could program it to where it could shift underneath, but since we've got folks coming to it from a phone browser, we wanna make sure that the footer doesn't completely take over the rest of the website. And you'll notice that each of the I classes right here, these are gonna be my font awesomes. So you'll notice Facebook official, it is actually the official Facebook logo. Instagram, Pinterest, Google Plus, we even did a calendar. And then if you come over here to fontawesome.com, here is the full gallery of all of your Font Awesome icons that you can use. Look, there's an accessible one. There's an Amazon one. There's an Amazon Pay. Apple, Apple Pay. Hey, if your library offers Apple Pay, you could throw that in there. You'll notice that some of these are marked Pro. The ones that you're going to want to look for are the ones that are included with the base license. SpringShare hasn't gone for a pro license yet. So, ah, okay. Now we go back to share files. We go to our smaller presentation of Doom. Share now. Mm -hmm. You guys get to see the uh, never ending recursive streak. So let's talk about specific resources that you can utilize. So we are going to be uploading a PDF version of this presentation to the Technology and Trends website. And I'm going to have a version that I will throw out on my personal Twitter, which we will get in just a little while. What we wanted to do with the resource list is we wanted to give you examples of different type of sources that you could go for. So we linked to the World Wide Web Consortium if you're interested in accessibility at all. We also linked to the Web Accessibility Initiative, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, W3 Schools. Interesting thing, it's actually not associated with the W3C a separate entity. They have great tutorials on HTML, CSS, JavaScript. They have an entire section for Bootstrap 3. This is where I got a lot of the hunks of code that you're going to see me utilizing on our website. So I've also linked to Bootstrap 3.3.7. This is going to be the version of Bootstrap that SpringShare is currently using. There are Bootstrap examples, including the sticky footer that I just showed you. The Bootstrap blog is a fantastic thing. If you click on it, it's going to give you news every time they put out a new version of Bootstrap. It also usually has a link to a great 80s music video. I believe when they rolled out 4.0, it was Journeys Any Way You Want It, which, you know, yay, hair metal. There's also the Bootstrap Customizer. So what you do with the Bootstrap Customizer is you can go through and actually customize your background colors, your font colors, your warning label colors, and then you can upload it to your web server and you can point to it on your administrative page for LibGuides. The Font Awesome icon list, I've already showed you. One of my favorite things to use, and it's totally, well, not really unrelated to everything else, is something called CodePen. When I'm coding within LibGuides, LibGuides puts all your HTML together as one giant hunk. What CodePen does is it lets me verify my HTML to make sure that I've closed all of my tags and I'm not going to inadvertently break the website, but it also puts the HTML into a format that's really easy to recognize. So now we are moving on. Since we've got Ooh, look at that, 16 minutes left. <laughs> so we've got time for what we affectionately call quibits, which are questions, comments, and existential crises. So does anybody have any questions for us? I know we covered a lot of material really, really quickly. The chat is being very quiet. Hmm. 
Do you think we scare them off? We might have. <laughs> I think it was the cat. That might have been the cat. Everybody, it's Julie again. Um... <laughs> Angela, you're exactly right. It's a lot of information to digest. What we wanted to do with this is we wanted to introduce a lot of the ideas. And I didn't want to throw a bunch of code at you because it is, you've got to figure out what you need for your personal website or your library's website. And what you can do is that resource list that's going to be um, thrown out on the TNT website afterwards, I would encourage you to just kind of pop through it and play with some of the functionality too. And with the recording, of course, we'll send out the contact information for Amanda and John so you can contact them directly. If you have very specific questions, I know they'd be happy to answer those. Yes, and actually, hey, we have contact information and we would love for anyone to get in touch with us. So my email address is up on the screen. It is arglenn, G-L-E-N-N-B, at unca.edu. You're also welcome to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Batgirl Librarian. Most of the time, you're going to hear me um, say crazy things that my cats and dogs are doing, occasionally complain about SEC softball, and uh, post pictures of riding my bike around Asheville. And you can email me at johnmbradley at abtech.edu. And I have this very creative Twitter handle, uh, John underscore M underscore Bradley. You can find me there, usually railing against something technology-wise. And then we also have a podcast that's going to be debuting soon. We've got four episodes already recorded. We're trying to get at least six in our hopper before we throw it out online. It's called The GB's Take On. Uh, we take on basically any kind of issue we want to. Our, our first episode is actually The GB's Take On Information Security and Information Literacy because that's what both of us work in. And you can follow us at Twitter jointly at The GB's Take On. I want to thank everybody again. Um, this is one in a series of webinars that Technology and Trends is going to be offering this year. We're going to have another one coming up in July. More information to come on that. Um, also, along with the recording, if you have enjoyed this webinar and if you're interested or think you have an idea that might fit within the Technology and Trends realm of librarianship, we'd love for you to um, send us a proposal. Um, and we're also looking for guest bloggers for the TNT blog. We're trying to get that launched back up. And uh, with the recording, there'll be a, a information form sent out in case you want to uh, try your hand at that. We have some suggested topics, but are open to others as well. Um, but I wanted to thank you again from Technology and Trends. Um, I'm Julie Rayner. If you haven't joined, Amanda mentioned at the beginning, it's if it's your first section or roundtable, it's free. Otherwise, it's $5 to join. And we're doing things like this, and we'd love to have anybody to come who would like to. Thanks so much.